Father, we come to thy presence with the attitude of gratitude, Lord, for giving us another opportunity that we brothers and sisters in Christ could come together and to learn from one another, especially what your scripture teaches. And uh, we want to know and learn more about you, Lord. The time we spend may be a time of blessing and fruitfulness in our lives. We want to hear your voice, O oh Lord, open our hearts and minds and speak to us through your servant. The hour which we are going to spend in your presence and everything that we do, O oh Lord, may bring glory to your name and uh, everything that we speak and discuss may be acceptable in your sight. We submit all of us to the throne of grace, asking for your revelation and asking for your illumination in our hearts. Thank you very much for listening to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, as we get into our study today, I wanted to just take a few moments uh, to help all of us understand how we have put our booklet together, you know, the We Believe series that we have been using. And so I just wanted you all to know uh, how, uh, what was the thought behind it. And so if Praveen can just put that introduction from the booklet onto the screen, uh, let me just read that for you. And then uh, we will proceed. If you notice on your screen under introduction, it says, welcome to We Believe. That is the name of the booklet that we have put together. A resource that assists adults and older teens in studying the core beliefs of our Christian faith. Uh, we Believe is grounded in the Holy Scriptures and expressive of GCI's statement of beliefs and incarnational Trinitarian theology. We believe draws on similar documents from other Christian denominations and utilizes key statements from the historic Nicene Creed referred to in the in, in we believe as the creed. And of course, it, uh, it uh, then lists out or rather it uh, reproduces the Nicene Creed. So I just wanted all of us to understand that obviously this we believe is a series that, uh, a series of basically core beliefs. Uh, now, some of it may have peripheral aspects to it, but we believe that these are the, uh, I, what, uh, perhaps I should say, uh, essential thoughts that a disciple of Jesus must entertain, must study, must adhere to. And so, Obviously, it doesn't en en encompass all the, you know, various subjects of the scriptures, but they are essential enough for us to have an understanding of what Christianity is all about, what our belief system, and perhaps you could say our worldview is all about. Uh, obviously, we are grounded, or rather we take our uh, material from the scriptures and uh, and similar documents from other Christian denominations. Uh, we um, we uh, definitely adhere to the fact that others also are led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, they can contribute, you know, in a very uh, very significant way to our understanding. Uh, we don't believe that we have the sum total of you know the truth. Uh, as we see it in the scripture. So we can, you know, uh, very much borrow from other denomination and denominations with regards to some of the subjects which they may have studied with much deeper uh, perspective and greater clarity. When it comes to us as a fellowship, you know, we've had some very unique experiences. And so we may be able to speak with greater you could say clarity on some subjects. For example, um, some of our core beliefs were borrowed from a very typical old covenant perspective. And I think we can speak with some sense of authority on how the old covenant differs from the new covenant, which, I, which we are yet to study, I guess. Uh, we'll come to that 
at a later time. So I think similarly, we can take, you know, uh, our understanding with regards to, uh, let's say, a subject like Trinitarian theology from many others who have been there before, and they have studied it with, you know, tremendous amount of uh, depth, and there is much we can understand. Theologians like uh, Karl Barth, uh, T. F. Torrance, and some of the more contemporary ones like Baxter Kruger and a few others uh, have, uh, you know, very, very good and solid grasp of some of these subjects, and we have benefited from them. We have referred to the creed, which is the Nicene Creed. And uh, right now we are studying those four identifying signs, which is mentioned in the creed. So I thought I'll just, uh, you know, just let you know how we have compiled this booklet. And that's the reason why I wanted to read through that. And so the way it is compiled might be, it might seem a bit disjointed or it might seem just a little dis disorganized, but you know, uh, hopefully as we are studying it, uh, we can bring some clarity into it. Uh, is there any thoughts uh, you may want to share with what I just mentioned before we get into the study of uh, the church, which we are doing right now? Uh, if not, uh, we you know feel keep thinking, and if you have any thoughts to share, we can uh, pick it up uh, during our discussion session. So let's then quickly go into uh, what we have been studying over the past, uh, I think, two or three uh, Wednesdays. One is um, basically it's about the church, and we are now in the section where we are talking about the identifying characteristics of the church. Last time we discussed how the church is one and how the church is holy, all right? There are four perspectives we are studying this particular subject from, that the fact that the church is one, holy, all encompassing, that is uh, how it is mentioned here in the booklet, and apostolic. So today we'll take up the, the remaining two. Let's go to page 32 in our uh, uh, booklet. Let's pick up the uh, question. We'll, let's pick up question number eight. Yeah, 9.8. In what sense is the church all encompassing? Let me read and then make a few comments. The church is called all encompassing, in brackets, Catholic in some translations of the creed, not in reference to a denomination, but from the original Greek meaning universal. The all-encompassing church holds the whole faith once and for all delivered to the saints and maintains continuity with the apostolic church throughout time and space, thus uniting in Jesus Christ all local congregations and various associations of the one universal church. Uh, there are basically two thoughts, uh, two dominant thoughts there. One, it uh, talks about maintaining the all-encompassing. Once again, that word uh, is different from some other translations. You know, like it, it, does, it definitely mentions Catholic, which means universal. And in some translations of the creed, it also mentions all-embracing, right? Uh, so, uh, and I feel that the all embracing probably is a better word to use than all encompassing that tends, tends to be a little confusing. But let's look at those two perspectives. And actually there is only one which I think describes all encompassing or all embracing. One, it says that it maintains unity with the faith that is once and for all delivered and the unity with the apostolic church through time and space. Now that is more uh, the identifying sign, which is the next one, which is the church is apostolic. And I won't spend much time there. We will go to the next question uh, or rather we'll discuss that when we go to the next question. But I think the main uh, uh, point that this word all encompassing or Catholic 
or universal or all embracing. Uh, what it means is that basically the church transcends all boundaries or any boundaries that are physical, geographical, institutional. In other words, the church includes and embraces all who have come to faith. I think that is what it primarily means. So all encompassing, which can be better translated, all embracing or Catholic, universal, uh, transcends, you know, all the boundaries and to embrace everyone, you know, uh, into its fold. That is those who have responded to the gospel and have accepted and come to believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Uh, I may just want to mention that this particular thought has also spurred what is today called the ecumenical movement. You must have heard the word ecumenical, ecumenism. Um, basically, the ecumenical movement is uh, a, a thought that tries to bring all Christians, no matter which denomination they belong, under one umbrella. And I think, I'm not sure about this, but I think that is also what spurred the beginning of the WCC. If you may, you may have heard the World uh, Council of Churches, the WCC. Uh, and so what they try to do is to bring all of the churches together because of our universal or Catholic nature of the church. Uh, we believe that we should not divide into sectarianism and uh, start, uh, you know, becoming too, uh, what do you say, too emphasizing on only particular perspectives of the faith. Uh, we must hold to the core beliefs and that should unite us. And so that is how the ecumenical movement came to be. Uh, the ecumenical movement says that they are trying to recover the apostolic sense of the early church and uh, basically emphasizes unity within diversity. So we can have device, uh, diversity, but we must maintain the unity. And that is uh, basically uh, the ethos of the ecumenical movement. Maybe we can, uh, you may have some thoughts on that. So um, that is basically what the uh, perspective on all encompassing basically means. All right. Let's move to uh, the next question. And uh, we'll pick up that last point uh, with regards to uh, the identifying sign, and that is apostolic. So the question reads In what sense is the church apostolic? The church is called apostolic for two reasons. First, because its members hold the faith of Christ's first apostles, they are in continuity with them and their message. Second, because the church, like the apostles, apostle meaning sent, is to proclaim the gospel and to make disciples throughout the world. So I think that is fairly uh, clear to us. Apostolic is basically a connection we have with the original apostles of Jesus Christ. All right. So the faith that was propagated by the apostles and, of course, preserved for us in the scriptures, the uh, one of the one of the criteria to uh, to say somebody is an apostle is that they actually saw Jesus. Uh, they actually witnessed Jesus. Uh, so it's interesting. Some people like to call themselves apostles today. But uh, uh, we, we also fell into that trap. But, you know, I mean, you can use that word, you know, in, you know, in a way that doesn't violate what maybe the scriptures are pointing to. The fact that the apostles are basically those who were with Jesus, who walked with him, who heard him, who witnessed him. Uh, and so in that respect, uh, apostles has a very uh, particular meaning. So the first is we hold to the faith uh, of, the, of Christ's first apostles. 
In other words, we are as a church to be in continuity with them and their message. All right. And of course, uh, the Bible is a very important document as far as that is concerned. It is that's where it is preserved. The, the, the teachings of the apostles are preserved. And today we know that the Holy Spirit leads us into more and more truth. But one important aspect of what we understand today is whatever we believe cannot contradict what is scriptural, what is written in the scriptures, what is revealed or written by the authors of the Bible. They cannot have a contradiction there. So whatever truth the Holy Spirit leads us into must be consistent with what the apostles have laid down for us. And the second aspect of apostolic, which basically mean the word apostle means sent, uh, is to proclaim the gospel to make disciples throughout the world. So the church is apostolic in the sense that we are also proclaiming the gospel. We don't keep the gospel to ourselves, but we, uh, you know, proclaim it like we discussed last time. It can be done uh, as a witness, you know, uh, in the way we live our lives and also through the word, the proclamation that goes out. And uh, so those two are basically pointing to the fact that the church is apostolic. So the church has to fulfill these two very important aspects to remain uh, the church of the apostles, right? Uh, that remains connected to the apostles. So I'll leave it there. There are so much we can say about that, but uh, uh, if you should have any thoughts, you know, feel free to share later on. Let's move then to uh, 10, the question number 10 in on page 33. Uh, I won't spend much time in 10 and 11 because they are connected and we discussed this a little bit you know, in the past also. But the question 10 reads, how are we as members of the church to view each other? And this was also something we discussed a little earlier in the same study that we were having about the church. But let me read the answer. It says, in union with Christ, we are united to each other within the body of Christ, the church. As Jesus, by his death, removed our separation from God, so by his spirit, we, he removes all that divides us from each other. The ties that bind us together in Christ are deeper than any other human relationships and are more fundamental than what distinguish, distinguishes us from one another. Uh, just a few thoughts there. One is that, you know, it says Jesus through his incarnation and of course, finally his ascension, has removed our separation from God. And maybe that is something that uh, is very important for us to keep in mind. Uh, you know, uh, Christ broke all the barriers and we know how that was even manifested or metaphorically reflected in the, uh, the curtain being rent from top to bottom. You know, the curtain that divides the Holy of Holies in the temple from the other areas. Uh, that is significant of the fact that Jesus Christ was breaking down all barriers. So separation has been conquered by Jesus and he has given, act, given us access to God. So uh, if I can mention, there is uh, still some churches that tend to believe and preach what we have come to call a separation theology. You know, uh, we must be careful that separation theology is no more scriptural because that separation has been removed by, uh, by Christ. And so since Jesus Christ has accomplished that, the, uh, the way we view, uh, you know, members of the church is that the tie that binds us together in Christ are deeper than any other human relationships and are far more fundamental than what distinguishes us from one another. So the tie that binds us, um, you could say has a, 
has a physical component, which is the fact that we are human, we share in our common humanity, and that in that respect, there is a physical component, but much more importantly, we share in a spiritual component, and that is accomplished by Christ. In Christ, we have now, we belong now one to one another because we belong to Christ and all, uh, and Christ belongs to all, we then belong to each other. So our bond, you know, is, you could say, has a physical component, but it goes beyond that to the spiritual. And so we are in one sense closer than just blood relatives. Uh, it's lovely to have, you know, blood relatives, but then we also are joined by the blood of Jesus, which goes and has uh, a greater meaning, a, a spiritual a meaning, of course, which is eternal. And so in that respect, uh, we view each other, uh, you know, in a, in a way where we have a commonality and anything that distinguishes us from one another is uh, what you say, um, you know, is it shouldn't divide us, shouldn't separate us. We can have diversity in, in the church, but uh, it should not separate us. We will move to question number 11 now. As I said, uh, question 10 and 11 has a, a connection to each other. But let's read question 11. It says, how are we to live out the oneness we have in Christ? We just discussed that oneness in uh, question 10. And now the, que the question is asked, how are we to manifest it? How are we to live it out? Uh, you know, and the answer is as follows. Through the Holy Spirit, we have communion with Christ, which means we share in the relationship that Jesus has with the Father and the Holy Spirit. As members of the body of Christ, we also have communion with each other through him. That fellowship is lived out by loving and serving one another and by worshiping together, hearing the gospel preached and together partaking of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, once again, um, that first part, you know, forms the bedrock, the foundational plank, you know, or the foundational stone for whatever we do. Uh, the oneness, I think we discussed that, you know, also uh, last time. That oneness that we talk about in the church is not a oneness that we have manufactured. Like, you know, uh, we come together in one, as one because we have some common interests. You know, uh, that's what we call a club. You know, a club is formed if you have a common interest, maybe playing golf together. Not that, you know, we have golf here, but we have a club where, uh, you know, we have a very famous club called Secunderabad Club. I don't know if Anil and Rekha have been there when you were in Hyderabad. Uh, but uh, I have been invited by some people who are members. I cannot become a member there because... Uh, it is so expensive and you the waiting period for that is something like 20 years. <laughs> you apply today, 20 years later, you get a, you know, a membership. But that's a club and people are come there and they have some common interests. But that is not the oneness that we are talking about. The oneness is the Trinitarian oneness, the oneness that exists between Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, and because of that oneness, which is invested by Jesus in his humanity to all of us as members of the body of Christ, we also have communion with each other through him. So our communion is made possible because of the communion that Jesus, you know, uh, uh, accomplished in his humanity, in his incarnation with all of us. And so... To answer the specific question, how do we live out that oneness? And it just mentions a few. I believe it goes beyond this. Uh, the fellowship is lived out by loving and serving one another, by worshiping together, by hearing the gospel preached, uh, together partaking of the sacraments, you know. Uh, so all of these are some of the ways we 
manifest that oneness, but I believe it can go much beyond that. Okay, so I will leave those uh, two questions now and we will take up 12. Let me just see uh, if I can discuss question 12 uh, at a little bit more detail and then we will get into our discussion. So this is the uh, last section that we will deal with today as time goes on. Here, this question deals with basically the gifts that God blesses us with, uh, our members of the church. And uh, there is much we can talk about the gifts, but uh, I will try to um, sort of uh, pick up thoughts from what is being uh, offered to us in the answer. So the question reads, how are we to serve within the church? And it says the Holy Spirit gifts each member of the church with certain gifts that are to be used to serve the church and through the church to serve the world. Each of these gifts, which vary from member to member, are important and are not interchangeable. They are essential contributions to the unity of the one body of Christ. The equality of the members of the church does not derive from the interchangeability of the parts, but in the fact that the gifts given, the members are all of grace, gifts from God through Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The differences among the members are good and are to be used to bless each other in ways that individual members cannot bless themselves. The differences in the church constitute a non-hierarchical ordering of the members where their gifts are utilized in and for love. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the, the specific question is how are we to serve? You know, remember we, we just discussed that the fact that we are one, the fact that God has built in this oneness, this Trinitarian oneness within our fellowship, uh, the body of Christ, that prompts us to serve. But how are we to serve? And even there, the service is made possible by the Holy Spirit by gifting us certain abilities, you know, uh, certain capabilities. The gifts of, uh, that, that the Spirit gives to us empowers us to do certain things in a way that, of course, finally and ultimately glorifies God. So each member of the, uh, of the body of Christ is gifted and those gifts may be used to serve one another. So the very first thought that comes to my mind is, uh, you know, each one of us have a gift and, and we are asked to consider those gifts that we might have and how are we to serve one another? You know, many times we ask the question, hey, I'd like to serve the church. You know, I'd like to do something. I'd like to contribute in some way, form or fashion, you know, uh, in the you know, fellowship of uh, the body of Christ. And we have to ask, well, what are you gifted with? There may be some gifts that God has given you. And you have to specifically, you know, if you are able to recognize it, use it, identify it. You and then let it be used to manif you know, manifest your service. Um, these gifts are basically unique to that person. There are certain gifts each one of us have, and uh, it is something that the Holy Spirit has given you. So that is, in that sense, it's not interchangeable, it says, right? In other words, you can, uh, you can contribute in that, in that gifting that is made possible by the Holy Spirit. Um, okay, so another important thing we keep in mind, these gifts are of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they, you know, Jesus Christ empowers us through these gifts to provide uh, us with the abilities to serve. And we can very clearly see some are more visible, some are probably not as visible. I've looked at myself and over the years, I have seen that uh, um, I never thought I could speak. <laughs> I was always a quiet one in the family. And 
And uh, I was even told once by somebody that, you know, if I have a tongue, because I never used to, I used to be the quiet one. But for some reason, God gifted me in a way where I have been able to use my tongue now <laughs> and be able to teach and preach. And lo and behold, I found that this is a passion with me. And I think Franklin Poppins can identify with that because he always says he has this passion for you know, speaking and preaching. And if you heard his preaching, you can see the passion he brings into it. And so each one of us, I think, can very clearly identify. And one of the ways that you can also identify that gift is if it is validated by others. You know, you think you may have a gift, but uh, the others may think otherwise. And so you may want to see if there is a validation by the congregation. And so that is also another way where you can identify your gift. Um, notice it also says, each one of us have different gifts. And it says that the differences among the members are actually good and are to use to bless each other in ways that individual members cannot bless themselves. In other words, we are gifted with some unique gift gifts so that it is to be used for blessing others, for the edification of others, for building up of others, right? Uh, it is done in a way where you don't bless yourself, <laughs> right? Uh, and in that respect, it's very sad that uh, sometimes, uh, you know, Christians uh, and especially Christian leaders, Christian preachers tend to use the gift to you know, to gain popularity or to uh, gain uh, uh, materially. Uh, and that is very unfortunate and it happens. That in one sense, I would say is an abuse of the gift. So the gifts are not used to, uh, to bless yourself, even though as you bless others, you automatically receive a blessing. But primarily the gifts are so that it is focused on blessing others. It is to be used to edify and build up the church, not yourself or your pockets, uh, which unfortunately is a, uh, you know, a, a, a weakness with, with probably uh, some in the, in the leadership of the church. So um, those differences, the different gifts that we have are actually uh, divinely ordained so that um, one important thing is that it shows that we need each other, right? Uh, I don't have all the gifting where I can say, well, I am happy and I'm joyful and I don't need anybody else. We are made to want each other. We together complete the body of Christ. We can never say that I don't need another person or another member in the church. Uh, they may have something to contribute to you and to yourself. Uh, you know, and also one, one more thought, and then I just want to read two paragraphs from another booklet, which I will come in just a moment, but let, let me just mention this. The gifts are non-hierarchical. That's what is mentioned in the answer, non-hierarchical, which means to say, uh, we must not think of the gifts as uh, having an order of importance that those who have the gift of preaching are more important than now they may have a certain significance I mean even in the book of Corinthians the apostle Paul says uh, you know love is greater right and so the exercise of love is definitely greater but nobody should think just because I have a particular gift I am better than somebody else or I am greater than somebody else, right? That would be, that is not scriptural and that's not biblical. So I'll just leave it there at that. So whatever gift you have, never think that you are more important than somebody else uh, because they have, you could say a lower gift. Uh, there is nothing like a lesser gift or a lower gift in that sense of the word. Some gifts may have greater significance in particular situation. I'm not denying that but we must not look at it as though one person is more important just because he has a gift or a particular gift, all right? 
Now, gifts, I think I mentioned, can be abused. Gifts are given to us by the Holy Spirit, so we build up the church. But how is it possible that we may abuse the church? And in that regard, let me read to you from uh, a, a booklet that is again uh, given by the church. It's available on our website. Uh, it is titled The Church and Its Ministry. Right? This is also available on the website. It's titled The Church and Its Ministry. Basically, it is written by uh, Dr. Gary Dedo, who is the president of our seminary. And uh, under, the, under, under the section, Abuse of the Differences or the Different Gifts, he writes the following. He says, because we live in the present evil age, the differences that exist between members can open up opportunities for abuse. This is true even though we are joined to Jesus Christ and participate by the Spirit in His sanctified human nature. But the stain of sin continues to take its toll. Because that is so, Paul addresses this problem. Some of the Christians he was writing to were misusing the differences of ministry giftings to assert their superiority over others. Others were reacting to the differences by declaring their autonomy, saying, I have no need of others. Some apparently denigrated themselves as having lesser gifts, ones uh, less respectable, and saying they had nothing to offer. So it goes both ways. <laughs> you know, some can think that I got, you know, a gift which is better or greater, and they then abuse it by putting down others or think that they have no need of others. Another way of, you, of abuse is you yourself think that, oh, my gift is not as important and hence I have nothing to contribute. Even that is an abuse. And I think it's important for us to take note of that. Let me just read uh, one more, a few more lines and then I'll stop. Uh, Gary Dedo goes on to say, Paul declares that all of these perhaps natural responses are distortion. All the gifts for ministry are given as God pleases. That's important. It is God who has given us these gifts. And so, uh, you know, if we say that we have a lesser gift, I mean, who are you finding fault with? You're ultimately finding fault with God. It goes on to say he distributes them as he sees fit. The wisdom behind the difference and distribution of gifts is that the body of Christ needs a whole range of gifts. But that does not mean that they cannot be harmonized or that all are not valuable. Paul declares that Christ can indeed enable them to work together to build up the body with each member having an important part to play, contributing to the common good. So it takes God's agape love to eliminate pride, envy and jealousy and the friction they generate. So, so that there can be a fruitful gift exchange, allowing the body to upbuild itself in love, as Paul indicates. This is the purpose for the beauty, for the beautiful unity and difference in the body of Christ. So there is a unity and that differences are then finally used for building up the body of Christ. Okay, so let me leave it there for today. And... Uh, you are now welcome to bring in some thoughts, comments, questions. So the forum is open now. All right, so we have the usual issue. Who goes first? <laughs> is it going to be Anil? Okay, I'll go. Yeah. Uh, I'm not very clear about this uh, all-encompassing aspect of it. The universal part I understand, but I mean, what is it? Uh, what is it encompassing? I mean, it's worldwide. Yes, is it one faith that it's encompassing, or what is it? It's. Uh, I'm not very clear about that. Okay, I think Anil, uh, you are probably stressing this word 
encompassing, all encompassing, right? I remember, in my view, that may not be the best choice of word. Uh, a better word would be all embracing. Uh, and we can look at the original Greek, Catholic uh, or universal. So the all encompassing is it encompasses everyone, no matter where they are. In other words, it has no boundaries. The church has no boundary. In that respect, it is all encompassing. In other words, it joins everyone together. I think that's the best way I can explain it. I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on that. Tell me, Anil, is there is there is there some is there still a a, a doubt there? Even universal would would uh, really mean that it's it, that it's universal. It touches everybody and so on, right? Okay. <laughs> is uh, Bertram, go ahead. Is Anil uh, maybe uh, possibly having in mind? I want to clear that that it's uh, like all embracing, like uh, all religions. Uh, all like, you know, all religion, like Hinduism says, you know, Hinduism also, uh, they have a belief of all embracing. Anil maybe feel like, uh, is everyone, you know, welcome or sort of uh, all religions, uh, you know, uh, have something to contribute. Uh, Anil is something of that nature, something of that, uh, like you, you are trying to tell? No, not really that it's, it, Christianity or the church embraces all religions or anything like not that but <clears throat> I'm not very clear as to what is this all embracing about who, who or what is it embracing the universal yes. aspect itself covers that right yes so I'm not very clear as to what all embracing or all encompassing yeah, what is it encompassing in other words or what yeah. is it embracing Okay. Yeah, some clarity. You need some clarity. Uh, even I would want uh, somewhat some clarity with, regarding okay. that. Okay. Uh, if I can just uh, offer one more thought there. Think of it. Think of it only from the perspective of people. Okay. Uh, don't go beyond that. I think that. See, the church is people, right? Uh, and so the word all encompassing is basically referring to the fact that the church embraces all people. Uh, the fact that Jesus Christ broke the dividing wall between God and humanity, the wall that we humans erected. And now his love, his sacrifice, his redemption now goes to all humanity, no matter what background or religion or creed they follow. It goes to all. But... The church consists of those who will respond, right? Even though that is available to everybody. It's God's, I mean, it's a Jesus Christ sacrifice is comprehensive. Right. But then there are those who respond and then become part of that universal church. So those are some yes. thoughts I can offer. That makes more sense. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Anybody else have any thoughts on that or maybe offer a explanation uh, can i ask you something yes sheila go ahead uh, does it mean uh, all the different denominations under one like uh, say the body of christ uh, <laughs> what i can say is that denominations are human made right uh, they are what we create as human beings uh, in God's eyes, uh, there is no denomination. God sees God, his people, no matter where they belong, right? Which institution they may belong to. Uh, and so denominationalism is created by human beings. Uh, but in uh, the eyes of God, the church of God is those who have embraced the love of Jesus and responded to the gospel and have accepted him as Lord and Savior. Does that help, Sheila? Yes, that means all believers, right? All believers, yeah. All those who have come to faith, yes. Okay, understand. Okay. Yes, Franklin, go ahead. 
Sir, all believers in the past, 12th century, 8th century, 4th century, and all those believers in the future, 100 years down the line. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Frankly, in fact, I think last time we even discussed uh, all believers in heaven. <laughs> in other words, uh, even those, yeah, when you say past, obviously many of them have passed on. And so uh, we had a question about it that even last time. What does it mean, heaven? Uh, maybe we'll discuss that a little bit more as we go along uh, in the other sections. But yes, uh, the church of God, the people of God, uh, you know, transcends time. <laughs> Past, present, future. Uh, Rekha and then uh, uh, Bertram. Yes, I was just thinking about that Satan always speaks on in half-truths. Like when he said, did God really say this? So sometimes we get confused because of this. The spirit uh, tells us about the truths, but sometimes half truths end, end in this and that causes confusion. So how does it fail? Uh, uh, yes, uh, that's true, uh, Rekha. He is, uh, says half true, but in what context are you saying that? Basically in the church also people use their imagination rather than adhering to what Jesus Christ has to say. Okay. Okay. In that respect, yes. Yeah. Uh, some we interject our own uh, uh, thoughts and interpretations, and then we tend to corrupt what the Bible is probably saying. Yeah. Okay. Bertram, you had a thought. Yes. Uh, uh, Christians uh, or believers are the ones in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. Now, uh, some. Uh, you know, is there any way to know if one is, <laughs> I'm sorry to say that, is, is any any way to know when we are called into a fellowship, communion uh, and fellowship with the sun, in the sun, and because we're in the sun, we are uh, connected to one another. Is there any way to recognize if one is having the Holy Spirit or a false spirit, like there's a member in the church, uh, you may be knowing who he is. Uh, who always talks that we are not having the true spirit of God and uh, only, you know, we are following a false Christ of uh, having a false spirit and hence, uh, and all denominations are corrupted and uh, uh, all that. So is there any way, uh, can you just mention, is there any way that sometimes I don't feel uh, comfortable, uh, maybe the other person doesn't feel comfortable because of me, uh, where we, you know, where we like uh, can fellowship have the same uh, like same love or you know the the genuineness uh, that, which uh, uh, which we can uh, you know relate to one another because of the holy spirit okay bertie um, you know uh, first i'd like to say that you may want to ask this this member or uh, you know this person how does he know somebody has a false spirit but you know the sign. <laughs> the, to believe in the sign. Yeah. <laughs> see, this, Three this days is the problem. Two. You see, yeah. he has his own criteria to say somebody does not have the spirit. Mm -hmm. Now that is that is that criteria scriptural? You know. Uh, yeah. So uh, you know, there's a big question mark there. So I, you know, once again, I think like some of you said. We bring in our own thoughts, our own interpretations, and then we start dividing people. And yeah. I think last time we discussed, I think Surya Murthy brought an interesting thought. God knows his people. Yes. Right? Uh, and sometimes we may think we know, we may think we are belonging to God, but lo and behold, they can be surprised, as it says in Matthew 7, yeah. Jesus saying to them, I don't know you. <laughs> that, yes. is, that can be uh, so unfortunate, you know. But coming to uh, identifying sign whether somebody has the Holy Spirit, now that, you know, I mean, once again, we are not given an explicit answer in the scriptures, but we can glean from some thoughts. Obviously, the person doesn't glow. Uh, he doesn't have a halo around his head. <laughs> uh, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit is manifested in someone who belongs to Jesus Christ. Now, that does not mean to say somebody is perfect, yeah. but the fruit of the spirit and how he conducts himself and behaves, you know, uh, I think 
can be uh, a very important perspective of how if somebody belongs to Christ or not. And Jesus Christ's very own words. You remember the, 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 the new commandment? Mm -hmm. uh, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. How? You love by, one another. By the love you have for one another. So these are ways we can gauge. But then I don't think we should engage in an exercise to start dividing people and say, well, he belongs, he doesn't belong, he belongs. That is not our job. Judgment belongs to Jesus Christ, not ours, not us. All right. So I can just say that uh, and leave it at that. Any thoughts anybody like to offer on that? Um, Sheila, you had a thought? Uh, uh, no. Okay. I thought you had that unmuted. Uh, Pr uh, Praveen, you, have, you want to offer any thoughts? In any of the thoughts we have discussed? Uh, regarding uh, somebody belong to the spirit and one Bible verse that comes to my mind that's in First John uh, where John says whoever says that Jesus Christ the son of God came in flesh he has the spirit of God. Uh, so perhaps one single uh, teaching or one single faith that can unite all of us and the one single faith that can uh, uh, help us to distinguish whether a person uh, is of i mean is of christ or whatever we had we discuss as the spirit of uh, spirit of god or not is the very simple fact that we believe about jesus christ that jesus is the son of god who came in the flesh yeah. and what is the gospel preached by apostles that is the same thing what is the truth that jesus was talking to uh, Pilate, Pilate asked, what is the truth? And uh, Jesus, uh, he, he was quite, we say that Jesus is the very truth. So what is that it is talking about? Jesus is the son of God primarily and he came in the flesh. What are we as believers of Jesus Christ believing? If we summarize everything in the sing in single sentence, we are believing that Jesus is the son of God and who came in the flesh. That's a, that, that's a simple thing that all we Christians are believing uh, across all denominations. So that, that becomes the common thread that unites all of us also having one faith for ecumenical uh, churches. Uh, and we can say one universal church in that sense we can take. And that is the one single thing that can help us to find who belong to uh, Christ. One simple thought. Yes, Anil, go ahead. Well, just adding to what Praveen said, uh, Jesus himself said in <clears throat> John uh, somewhere that uh, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed? And you shall know the truth. So, you know, the, the whether to know where a person is in Christ or not in Christ or he has the spirit or not, I think if he continues in the word, that's a good test. Yes, Anil. Uh... Uh, I think, uh, like Praveen said, you know, you cannot just isolate one scripture and say, well, that is the litmus test. But I think there is a inclusive way we can uh, begin to recognize uh, how, you know, we are in the faith. Unfortunate, uh, but uh, like Bertie was mentioning, uh, there are some who take that one scripture and then uh, will eliminate most of Christianity and, uh, you know, uh, and that is that is not how what what we read in the scriptures. And along with that, as we are reading uh, the creeds from the ancient uh, uh, days, we hear the word uh, universal church or Catholic church. These are we are hearing. Most of the times, we tend to feel uh, uh, it is finding about one true church and all. It's not at all about that. The moment we hear the word uh, Catholic or universal, it tells that we are respecting all the differences. Uh, in uh, they, All of us, we have differences. The word universal is, is itself is talking about uniting all, the, leaving all the differences aside and uniting. Otherwise, the creeds and all can say there is only one true church. They did not say that. There is universal church. They use these words uh, because uh, we constantly fight on saying we are the only true church. 
So the moment we hear the word universal or Catholic, we need to remember and understand that reminds us that we, leave, we are leaving unnecessary, uh, unimportant differences aside and come together uh, in Jesus Christ. So yeah. that is the message we need to take as we talk about universal church. I think that is uh, well said, Praveen. And maybe if I can just use that uh, to come back to your question, Anil, all encompassing, you can think of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ is all encompassing because he embraced all of humanity in his incarnation. So uh, maybe on that note, <laughs> we can end. I think it is already just uh, one time. Yes, but go ahead. Uh, the the says that there's one one spirit, one body, one faith, one baptism, one hope, one calling, one Lord, one God who's over all, above all, through all, and in all. So uh, as Praveen says, uh, there is no one true church. Uh, we have to be a little careful in that, in the sense that there is uh, the body of Christ. Uh, as you say, God knows who who are His. And that uh, we cannot sort of just, uh, you know, take it lightly and, uh, you know, gloss, gloss over it by not saying uh, the people of God and, uh, you know, the disciples of Christ. It is the Holy Spirit given to us and, uh, and uh, we become members of the body of Christ. And the scripture says there's only one body, one spirit, one body, the body, uh, the body of Christ. And uh, that, of course, we have to leave it to the Lord. <laughs> he knows who are His, and uh, because of the Scripture also says, "I know mine, and mine know me." <laughs> uh, that way, just a okay. uh, just a thought, Mister Zakaria. Just a thought. Okay, okay, Bertie. Uh, I think uh, Praveen, you want to just clarify that so that there is no questions left. Um, of course, definitely. We uh, when we are uniting, we are. I I don't and uh, I uh, it does not. Uh, undermine the value of uh, having a right faith, the correct one true faith. So it is not at all about those. Even if you take Ephesians chapter 4, we have one body, one uh, one faith, one father. All these things are not talking, uh, they are not uh, uh, talking about one true church. There is only one true church. These are the credentials of it. No, it is talking about Christ. So in Christ, God has divided all the walls of differences and made us one. That is the main point he is trying to emphasize. So what we said is there is there is one faith. If we say there is only one single faith that is complete and that is only correct all and all the others are wrong, what no, happens no. is that is we are reading into the text. That is called uh, in interpretation methods, we call it reading into the text. We take one word and we get into too much of grammar of that. Uh, but when we, we need to take it in the context. It is talking about you, you unity only, actually. As somebody, some church father said, uh, as Christians, we should be like, you know, we should uh, have unity in essential things, liberty in non-essential things, and charity in everything, in all things. So that should be the motive that we should have. And in fact, Jesus had. Jesus, uh, Jesus explained uh, similar things. You know, when uh, Jesus never tried to, never told a Canaanite woman, oh, your religion is wrong. You should change and you should become the Hebrew, the Hebrew religion and you should take uh, Judaism and my teachings and follow me. No, he did not do all those uh, stuff. He did not tell them your people are wrong and all those things. Whoever come, he accepted them. And he, uh, he taught them and he corrected them. So that should be the attitude we should be having. Uh, like accepting everyone and standing for one uh, one truth that is on that's on essential things and non-essential things we can just give uh, we can have liberty you know the uh, so their Pharisees are the good example uh, uh, they are the people who are fighting on all non-essential things even tithing on the mint so that's Jesus correct. comes and corrects them uh, and uh, there, there are so many examples we can find in the Bible. Jesus followed that example. And especially in Ephesians, it is talking about the unity of the church and oneness and the divisions that Christ has broken through the cross. That, that, that is an overarching theme. So we should stick to that and we should not read into the text and say there is only, only one true faith. 
Okay, thank you, Praveen. Uh, but if you still have any, um, you know, any clarity that you need, you can text either me or uh, Praveen, and we can always help you. No, it's okay. It's just yeah. that. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's okay. I have, yeah. I have, I have, I have found out what Praveen is trying to say. Uh, we once we said we are the only true church. I think we should not do that any longer, and we don't claim that. Uh, you know, we don't keep saying. We have stopped saying that, and rightly so because we as uh, Anil says we have to be led by the Holy Spirit and led by the Word of God and by the Spirit of, uh, Spirit of Christ. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, that helps. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Let's close with a prayer. And if I can request Vincent, uh, Vincent, would you do the honors for us today and close the session in prayer? Yeah. Almighty God, Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity you, you have given us to meet together to study our holy word, your word which is life. Help us to understand everything that we have heard. Help us to grow more in wisdom and knowledge. Help us to teach others through the through our lives, our family, our neighbors, that all of us one day may be together in one spirit in Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you again. Uh, have a good rest of the day. God bless you.